Good morning, everyone. This is the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee. I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge. It is just after 9 a.m. on April 7th, 2021. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, this morning, we're going to have an update from um, Ellen Kaler regarding food security, in particular, the regional food system supply chain um, and, and to see if there are any updates. And so um, Ellen, if you would like to um, take it away, I'm hoping you have something to tell us. <laughs> and uh, I, this is one of the more exciting things for me in terms of um, the future of our committee and the future of agriculture is to, to, to crack this nut. So ha take it away, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Nice to see you all again. And I'll be seeing you tomorrow too, as we, uh, Louise Calderwood and Regina Feidler and uh, President Pat Bolton will be in with you and the Senate Ag Committees to talk about Vermont Tech's Ag and Food System Program Transformation. Um, so uh, it's uh, a little feast or famine. Like we were here a lot in February and then it's been what, a month and a half and here I am again to see you all. So nice to see you. Um, yeah, in terms of an update, um, we have, since um, you all were part of that presentation that we made back in February uh, to the legislative uh, body of your peers. So I'm happy to answer uh, questions, additional questions that maybe have arisen for you since then. Um, Basically, what I can tell you is that we have made some very good progress. We uh, hired a, a part-time staff person who's actually going to go up to full-time next this coming Monday with the funding that we've raised to date. Um, and she's been tremendous uh, addition to the team uh, supporting this project, New England Feeding New England um, uh, project which is, uh, again, as a reminder, especially for those who may not know about it, it is a, um, a, a six state initiative to try to uh, increase uh, the reliability of our food supply chain within the region. Uh, and to do that, to expand production of regionally produced food, whether that's harvested, you know, grown, uh, raised, caught uh, in our fisheries, uh, so that 30% of the food that we consume within the six state region is, is, comes from and is produced from within this region. Now, you may have remembered that I originally talked about 35 by 35. Our group has since changed that as of yesterday to 30 by 30. And the reason primarily is because uh, there are so many 30 by 30 initiatives that we didn't want to be confused. <laughs> So we thought that it would be better to be in alignment with it, what everybody else is doing, which is 30 by 30. We know how pivotal this uh, decade is. And so uh, it's, it's, it's still in line with 35 by 35, but um, it, it's a little bit nearer in, which increases the pressure, quite frankly, in terms of reaching that. We know here in Vermont that we're somewhere around uh, probably about 15% We'll know more later this year exactly, but um, as of a few years ago, anyways, it was close to 15% uh, that was um, Vermont consumption of Vermont produced food. So to get to 30%, even in Vermont, is a big lift, let alone across the entire six state region. So, um, so we are underway uh, with the project, and having a full time staff person now is going to help that process a lot because. Uh, a lot of what is going to be involved over the next year and a half in particular is research, researching and developing milestones for each of the six, six states in terms of what could be produced in those states, given available land, given available fish stocks, given uh, workforce, given infrastructure needs, given soil types, like what could we actually even get to 30%? And that's one of the big questions. Uh, you know, we have this as a as an aspiration to get to 30%, but until we actually crunch the numbers and really start talking with producer groups to see what they think the market is is signaling, and until we get more consumers actually uh, requesting regionally consumed or regionally produced food, um, it's going to be a big lift. There is no way around it. 
Um, but I think that the energy and uh, is there to try. And I think that there's uh, obviously with this past year of COVID, we've all uh, had a, a real wake up about uh, just the fragility of some aspects of the food supply chain in this country and the opportunities that this presents for rural economic development, for profitability and viability of our farms and, and food businesses and our, and our fishers in the region. Um, I think there's, uh, it's really time to double down. So I think in terms of uh, ways that, that you all can continue to support this effort, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Invest, 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 and uh, and 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 do what you can do to to uh, help clear away bottlenecks that have been identified uh, in the food supply chains in Vermont. Um, and so, investments in Working Lands Enterprise Fund, uh, working any other kinds of uh, uh, low cost or or grant related programs. Uh, for food related businesses and farms are really critical. You know, the, the, because we, we, we need to, we, not only do we need to expand production, but we also need to expand processing facilities, especially meat processing facilities. We need to expand our distribution system. We need to expand the ability of food, and Vermont food ambassadors to actually uh, rep products into, into regional markets. Uh, to get more of our products uh, out both regionally as well as uh, in stores here in Vermont. Uh, we need to be investing in uh, more storage capacity, uh, more warehousing, more cross docking operations, um, just overall things that just physically help to move food, especially from small producers who um, have less access and, and uh, it's, it's a higher cost for them. So getting more lower cost options for um, smart distribution uh, is definitely gonna be needed. And I think that keeping an eye on those kinds of things as you review bills, as you consider uh, funding opportunities um, is gonna be really critical, uh, I would say for, for you all to be really keeping an eye on and, and really trying to move. Ellen, um, John has his hand up. Uh, John, go ahead. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, Ellen, I didn't mean to cut into your introduction, but I, just as you blew by the 30 by 30, I wondered, uh, is there any reliable data for what those six states are doing now? Like if Vermont's doing 15, what's New England doing? Yeah, um, there is not reliable in the form of the methodology that we've developed and that we implement every three years here in Vermont. Um, but the, part of the research that is about to get underway is in fact to try to establish what that baseline is. Uh, it will not be as robust as our baseline in Vermont because we have access, we have so many partners who are willing to provide the data. You know, like the hospitals give us their data, the Sodexo give us, us their data. We get it from individual producers like Ben and & Jerry's and Cabot, for instance, because a lot of them are going direct to consumer or direct to an institution and may not be picked up through the distributor data that we get. Um, you know, we get, we, we get, we, in the past, we've gotten one of the three chains, the uh, regional uh, grocery store chains to provide their data. Uh, the, most of the distributors give us their data. So like that just does not exist in the other states, unfortunately. So we're going to do the best we can, but yes, the plan is to create that baseline because then we need to be tracking progress over the next 10, 15, 20 years about how we're doing with that and, and figure out the method for how we're going to do that, given the realities of every state being you know, different and much more populated than us. And so we just, we have a harder time reaching a, a critical mass of folks that will share data. Do, do you, have you heard any ballparks for where New England is right now? I mean, is it like 2%, is it 8%? I've heard, I've heard people kick around 10%. I don't know how real that is yet. I'm not a, I'm not a data cruncher researcher type, but that's what I've heard from some folks that have looked into the into the numbers. I think that one of the big questions, um, and you may recall that slide I had of the, the the three circles of the what we produce in Vermont and that or in New England, and then what gets imported and what gets exported. 
Um, and one of the things that we don't really know is of what is produced, what actually stays here. So that's like one of the hardest things I think for us to really get a handle on because it, it's just moving all over the place. So, um, uh, so that's one of the things we'll be working on. So we're in the process right now of setting up a, a research advisory committee across the six states that of people that really understand data, understand uh, what we're trying to do. And then we'll be, uh, we'll be setting up uh, contracts with uh, and developing an actual research team from across the region of experts uh, that really know how to understand the data sets that are available um, to really try to, to dig into this and come up with the baselines and, and help us also assess consumer demand. Um, so we're gonna be looking at uh, primarily secondary research uh, where there's been consumer demand analysis done across the region, because you, know, you, you gotta have both <laughs> supply and demand together. Um, so we're going to be digging in. Uh, I don't think we're going to have real strong sense for probably nine months to a year once we really get underway because just it's, there's just so much to look at. Um, but that shouldn't stop the work in any way, shape, or form. I mean, the, the bottom line is, as I mentioned, it's, it's invest, 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 and uh, and not just grant dollars and 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 low interest loans, but then the other core piece, key piece is investing in the infrastructure of our business and technical assistance provider community. Uh, because we have seen through this pandemic, as I'm sure you've heard over and over again, the real need for better business acumen among not only farms, but also food businesses uh, across the entire supply chain and not just in ag and food, but also in forest products. So we really need to make, I think a, a significant investment in the people infrastructure that work with business owners uh, to improve their businesses. Because we know that when they improve the profitability of their businesses, they tend to pay better wages and, be and they can afford benefits. They can afford uh, better um, technology. Uh, they can afford uh, the ability to have better practices uh, for food production, whether that's on the farm or in, in our uh, manufacturing facilities. They just they have more funds available for marketing. You know, it's sort of like so much of this really does rest on the business acumen of, of that, um, the head of the business, the head of the farm, and whether they really have things dialed in the way they, they could. And, you know, people, people on the ground are it's some of the more expensive and ongoing needs, but like we have just not invested in the people power infrastructure in our state. I mean, it's amazing what's been built up on so little. And as we said in the, in the strategic plan, you know, we identified another 40 plus people, full-time equivalents that we need on the ground working uh, in a variety of ways with our farm and food manufacturers. Thanks, Ellen. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a couple more, but Vicky, Vicky's got her hand. Okay, go ahead, Vicky. This is also a follow-up, I think, on what John um, got us talking about, Ellen. And <clears throat> for the first couple years here that I've been on the committee, we talked a lot about getting our products out, you know, to all, all these cool markets, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, all these cities we're surrounded by helping our farmers to get the profitability of the Vermont brand. So how do we do both? How do we take care of ourselves, you know, to produce for ourselves and increase the Vermont brand and, and get our products out? So I'm sure you've been thinking of this as well. Uh, but I, I, I think it's vital we continue on with, with what we can grow here and in our region, but uh, also the, the way we wanna sell ourselves out there. So, I don't know if you have any comments on that. A really important question. Thank you for asking it. Um, it, it is a both and. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with scale. So we always talk about uh, there's a, a triangle that exists between the, uh, uh, the stage of the business's development, the scale of their operation, and then 
the kind of market outlet that they want to get into. So if you're, if you're a really early stage business and you're very small scale, the likelihood that you're going to be able to reach and supply a Boston market is pretty much nil, <laughs> right? So what, what are the right market outlets for you as you start and grow, to grow your farm or grow your food business and you are going from, say, small to Vermont small to Vermont medium, uh, for instance, right? You can go from direct market. A lot of people start with direct market sales for that very reason, um, because the price point is better for them. They, can, they don't have any middle people to be paying. So farmers markets, CSAs, farm stands, your uh, local co-ops, those kinds of, of places are great for being able to start off and build. But then as you grow, or if you're a farmer or a food business that has aspirations of eventually selling into more regional wholesale markets, then, you know, you need different forms of capital, you need more workers, you need, uh, you get into more permitting issues because you're in a manufacturing environment, um, you need to have access to distribution, you need access to those markets. And so it brings in then a level of complexity uh, and it also lowers your 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 price point because there's just a lot more costs associated uh, with being able to produce at scale. So you need that volume to offset that. So all of those things are are part of why you know it's it is really important to invest, I think, in the business and technical assistance provider community that works with these farms and food businesses to really assess that. You now where do you where do you want to sell? Okay, you want to start selling into, uh, regional markets, well, what are your options? Maybe you should start with selling through Farmers to You, which you know pays a decent price to the, the producers. And then they're the ones that are is delivering the food down to the Boston families as a for instance. And from there, maybe you, you learn more and then you can think about, oh, okay, well, maybe I should see about getting into say the Hanford's chain or something like that. So how do I do that? And there's just a lot of learning that, that needs to happen on that side of things. So it's not just, you know, flipping the switch to say, okay, we're gonna just all start selling things using the Vermont brand and selling regionally because it depends on your scale. It depends on what you wanna do, uh, who you wanna sell to. So that's where this both and comes in is I guess how I would answer your question. It sort of, it depends on who wants to do what. And that's part of what we need to suss out here is um, as we do this, the sort of the number side of, 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 the, of the project, the New England Feeding New England project, um, we also need to be vetting that with all the producer associations and all of the uh, private sector actors to say, what do you think? Like, is this even doable? Do you want to do this? <laughs> what would it take to do this? How much additional capital? You know, wh what else from an infrastructure standpoint would be needed? Um, we've never really gotten into that level of, of, of asking and exploring from an intentionality perspective of actually intentionally developing things in that way. And so we're going to, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I don't know if that answers your question, Representative Strong, but that, that's how I'd think about it is it's really is a both and and it's working with folks to really figure out where do they want to sell and, and in what way and what do they need if they want to grow and to expand beyond the borders. And what comes to my mind also is we should be so lucky, you know. Um, I think, you know, our goal before the pandemic hit was to get as much Vermont produced product out into those metropolitan areas and you know, just to increase everybody's markets here. But then, um, the pandemic hit and we started asking ourselves, you know, when, when there was no chicken on the, in the food, the grocery, the big grocery stores and, and um, no pasta and, you know, who, you know, it looked like post-war Russia, you know, or <clears throat> the Soviet bloc, when you'd see these empty shelves, it's like, oh my word, we've never seen this before. I think it was actually a really good wake up call for us that, it, you know, the system is, as your map of the U.S. indicates, our, our system is really fragile. And, um, you know, one bad situation in a certain part of the country can have a real impact on 
all all sorts of places around the state. So um, so that's I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you all were thinking about this before Ellen, before the pandemic hit, but. Um, it seems like that was a real wake up call for us regarding our food. Um, so um, I don't know if you yeah, want to comment. I, Go I ahead. Just, I just say on that final point is, is, you know, and I think the other way that it's a both and is that and we've seen this right over time, some producers do do both. Like they have strong local markets and they have some percentage of what they produce that they sell into the region. So that's another uh, avenue to really explore. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I saw Tom's hand up. Tom, did you get your answers, your, your question answered? Uh, sort of. Uh, Ellen, uh, when she answered uh, uh, Representative Strong's question, you kind of uh, touched on it, I think. And, but I, I, let me ask it. Um, you know, when I walk through the uh, large supermarkets, Ellen, uh, you walk through the frozen food section and you see um, tons of green giant bird's eye. And I mean, you see these, they have amazing processing uh, ability and uh, distribution ability. And are we, is there anybody in New England that can, that can even think about doing that kind of, uh, that kind of work, processing huge amounts of beans, corn, peas, whatever, the freezing, canning, is there anybody in New England that does that? That's a good question. I don't know the answer, and that's part of what we want to look at. We want to actually do some um, sort of asset mapping of a sort of trying to identify who it has uh, capacity at scale to be doing this kind of thing. I think what comes to mind is, is like uh, where, where there is probably something equivalent to what you're saying is going to be in up in northern Maine with potatoes, right? Because the mm -hmm. potato producers up there are producing for McCain and uh, Orida and uh, different um, uh, national and Canadian brands. What I don't know is whether those potatoes are just being shipped across the border and processed in Canada or whether there's actually some processing happening in northern Maine. I just don't know enough yet uh, about you know, assets. Right. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to finding out because <laughs> I really well, don't know right now. Just, just to add to that, I, I read a while ago, uh, and I talked about this to uh, the director of the Maine Farms, kind of uh, uh, gotten to know him, uh, the Maine, University of Maine Farm. And he has a, uh, a, a guy he works with a lot who's got, I think he said a thousand acres or 1200 acres of broccoli up there. And he is, grows various kinds for some reason. I didn't know there were so many kinds, but he has the processing he, he cleans and bags it and ships it right from his farm. And I was kind of amazed by that. It's got to be a huge volume in you know, certain times of the year. But I don't know how you, could, how you do that. It was amazing. Yeah, and, you know, and I think you raise a really good point around the acreage. You know, it's one of the other key aspects here um, is protecting our, our finite and valuable uh, farmland in this state. Uh, from development, we need to keep that ag land in production, um, and and especially as generations change hands uh, with that land, to find uh, create additional creative ways to really ensure that that finite resource stays in agricultural production because we need that land to grow on. Uh, so you know, up in up in northern Maine, there, Arista County, they have large wide open tracks uh, and, you know, 1,000, 2,000 acre farms that are in vegetable production. We, you know, we have a number of those kinds of farms here in Vermont, uh, but they are for primarily dairy for, and they're in hay and corn and and such for feed for, for the dairy industry. So while that's important to have that feed come from here to feed the animals that we have here, because then we're not importing more phosphorus, we're, we're growing the feed here. Um, if though that any of those very large tracks come on, uh, are gonna not change hands to another dairy operation, you know, we all are very concerned about, well, what's gonna happen to that thousand acres? And in some cases it goes to another dairy farm and, and they are able to add animals and um, expand their, their feed sources. Um, so it stays in production in that way. Um, but when, you know, a two or 200 or 250 acre 
parcel comes open that could actually be in vegetable production, like the way that Pete's Greens operates at, how do we help manage, how do we help that to happen more? <laughs> because we, we know we need greater vegetable production and, and we can do it in the state. You know, there's plenty of really amazing growers um, who struggle to find uh, land at scale for their aspirations. And I think this is especially land that's together, you know, like I know, yeah. like Burnt Rock Farm in, in the Huntington area, yeah. you know, Justin is primarily supplying for regional or for um, for wholesale markets, uh, sells into healthy living and the co-ops and everything. He's an organic farmer. But, you know, every time he wants to expand beyond his six acre home farm, he's got to go find and compete against uh, other uh, interested uh, farmers to get like another few acres here and then down the road and a few acres there and then down the road another few acres there and that's not that's not efficient right we need these larger tracks to stay in place uh, in whole pieces so that they can be farmed more efficiently sorry and part of the concern oh go finish your thought ellen no, 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 I'm done. I, I apologize because I you were you were starting and I broke No, it. no, 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 no. I no, it's it, the, there's a lag here with Zoom, so I, I don't want to cut you off at all. But I, I will say that this was part of the concern um several years ago as um farmers were being vilified for the pollution in Lake Champlain. And um, you know, I I was aware of the fact that there were there were farmers who were saying, well, you know why should we put up with this crap? Um, why don't we just sell our land for development? You know, which we know is even worse. It's multiple times worse in terms of phosphorus pollution uh, in terms of the lake. So um, I think that the more we can encourage people to A, stay in farming um, in, in some form or other, but you, know, you, can bro you can grow brassicas vegetables here very easily. And, um, you know, so there, I think there's some really good fits for if, um, you know, if people who are involved in dairy want to get out, there are ways that we can make this happen. It's just a matter of how. So, yeah, and, and I think that one of the other, the other opportunities is that we're currently exploring through the, um, we have some research going on through Farm to Plate right now that the Community Foundation helped to fund, uh, which is, um, so we stood up, uh, we reconstituted a, a meat supply chain task force within the farm to plate network. And we have some research going on right now um, by a fellow who's got deep connections in the, in the beef industry and used to work at uh, the Intervale as a farm, farm advisor. Uh, and he's exploring uh, Wagyu Holstein and, and Wagyu and other types of dairy milking herd crosses breed crosses with the idea that um, to uh, what you might lose a little bit in actual output on the dairy, on the um, fluid milk side, you might be able to gain by having a higher quality beef animal when that when it's time for that animal to be culled. And so looking at genetics, looking at um, additional grazing uh, opportunities, and then looking at how to better facilitate uh, the the and and, and enable the, the sort of the quality of, of the what becomes the dairy beef animals to get a higher price in the market as a way of supporting the dairy industry's um, struggle to make it just on fluid milk alone um, is something that's also being explored right now and I think has some some great potential uh, and I was um, uh, talking recently with. Uh, Heather Darby from UVM Extension. If you haven't had her in lately to talk about some of what she's learning from the research, looking at uh, grass, uh, converting some of the uh, conventional dairying over to at least some amount of grass grazing, some amount of grazing, um, she's finding some pretty significant um, uh, results to her research uh, in terms of improved components uh, of the milk and milk quality, as well as then the price being paid to farmers uh, for that milk. And so it, it, there's some really um, interesting uh, results coming out of some of her field trials and, and working with farms up in Franklin County. So if you haven't had her in lately to talk about that, I would encourage you to do that because it sounded pretty exciting. Okay, I'll put her on the list. 
Um, John, go ahead. <clears throat> Alan, this, this whole subject just makes my mind explode with, <laughs> with question. When you start thinking about food and then regional food, uh, you know, just working from the top down, I'm thinking about education and, and cultural choices. So, you know, what percentage of, of Vermont, you know, buys its food at say the big supermarkets or Walmart or Dollar General, and then you work down to the, like, the, like Tom saying, the aisles in those stores. And you're thinking, you know, what percentage of, of shopping carts are full with, with essentially thinking of Michael Paul, like processed food, not, you know, celery, but Cheez-Its. And then, you know, it, it, you think like, okay, in order to, to somehow <laughs> increase our, you know, what we eat locally, it just seems like there's a, a lot of education or at least the alternatives have to be there. And, you know, it took a COVID crisis for us all to be like, well, we can go to the CSA or we can go, yeah. um, you know, something more locally just because, A, that was the only option or B, uh, you know, we can, we can actually, I mean, we'll try something different. So, you know, where, where does that all come into this conversation? That's a really good question and, and, uh, and really, really important part of this. You know, it is supply and demand. And, uh, and then you add in the desire uh, and real need to also be growing and raising and producing culturally appropriate foods for our increasingly diverse population, not only in Vermont, but also New England. Uh, and then you add that on as complexity on the supply side, as well as how do you get markets to actually um, uh, bring th those culturally appropriate foods in so that that consumers can actually can actually buy them <laughs> right right because we know that for some stuff there is definitely a demand and it's like you can't get it um, so yeah no I think that that is going to be a key part of this and why it's it's a heavy lift right it's like we could the easy part in some ways the easy part is going to be crunching the numbers on the production side right as, as complex and complicated as that is uh, to, to figure out how to do, that's the easy part. The hard part is gonna be not only figuring out how we would scale production, but then how do we also uh, have the level of consumer awareness and consumer demand signals that then um, allow for everything to start to, to sync up in the marketplace. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and that's where I think we've got a huge advantage uh, through farm to school all these years. I mean, it's training the next generation of eaters. But beyond that, there's still a lot that can be done to talk about the importance of, uh, of healthy local food choices. Um, and then of course we have the access issues because not everybody can afford uh, what it costs to produce a lot of the food that we produce in this region. And so how do we, how do we manage and navigate that as well? Um, so I don't have any answers for you. I have just as many questions, uh, and uh, but I think I think we are in a better position than, than we were, say, ten years ago, understanding the complexity and the uh, and then COVID has provided the real impetus to like get going on this, you know, to really like step it up and um, and be able to uh, to try to tackle this. So on a nuts and bolts question, then, you know, if we look at working lands, uh, we've got a governor's base budget around half a million, and all of a sudden, there, there may be this one time 5 million. So have you been in discussions like, okay, this isn't going to happen every year, where, where do we really invest this, this, you know, multiplier of 10 in just what you're talking about? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and I and I I think that uh, it's not for a a, a lack of uh, on the agency's part uh, to um, have a higher budget. I think they have felt constrained, and so I think that's where you all come in as well is to um, not only uh, uh, talk about the importance and the imperative of of a higher working lands uh, enterprise fund allocation every year when you get into session. But to be also having the conversations outside of session, because um, I think I think we can all be united in understanding the opportunity from an economic development standpoint and the imperative from a food supply uh, perspective. And I think this this could be one of those areas where, like, mm -hmm. we just need to 
we not we need to stop jockeying around and just like this is what we need to do and there's and we know what the benefits are so let's let's just do this yeah i think one of the uh one of the benefits to all this is that working lands has been such an incredibly successful program that when we go to appropriations, it's it the it sort of sells itself. You know, I don't even feel like I have to make a, a full pitched effort just because people really recognize what a great program this has been. It's affected all 14 counties. Um, you know, pe people just really see the value in that program. Heather, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, John really touched upon all of my points too in that educational component and, and really making sure that folks understand seasonal and what that even means of what's available. But also I'm thinking about the cultural shift that needs to happen in terms of consumption. And I think that we do play a role in that, as you were saying, it's that investment. And if they're seeing that we're investing in these areas, then I think that that is what is going to have that cultural shift. It's what we're saying is important, has importance, is what's going to alter that. And I think that that is a really critical point to lay home on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally agree. And, you know, one of the exciting things that happened within this last year and a half um, is uh, through the health cross-cutting team within the Prime Plate Network is uh, Suzanne Kelly from the health department has been active, you know, for the whole life of the Prime Plate Network. Uh, and, she does a lot of work with communities and trying to get more healthy food into grocery stores and, and, and convenience stores and other places. And they were able to get into the state's health improvement plan uh, a year and a half ago, uh, a uh, d desire to have, uh, to really work at increasing healthy local food consumption and have, indicate, have cited the health cross-cutting team as their sort of go-to, um, advisors for that particular part of the health improvement plan. So uh, I think they're, the health department's on board. And, uh, and, and I just think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how, once we get past the, the, the direness of the COVID uh, pandemic, how we can sort of get back on track and really, uh, they'll be able to really continue to push on, on their end of things. But I think there's a real awareness of uh, food as medicine kind of ideas are really, really taking hold uh, much more so and, and much more under, understood now than they were, you know, even five years ago. You know, the whole veggie prescription program of getting, allowing doctors and, and such to prescribe produce <laughs> as part of your diet uh, because of your chronic diseases. Like the, that's, that, that's totally transformational that, that, you know, is not going on five, six years ago. Yeah. You know, and I, this is just kind of a strange observation um, that I'll make here. Um, because of the pandemic, um, I, I typically shop at Hannaford and, you know, we raise basically all of our own meat. Um, I had a disastrous broccoli crop this year. It was horrible. I don't even, I think we ate one broccoli head during the summer, but I have beans and what have you. So I do. So when I shop, I'm basically going around the outside, you know, um, and, and yeah, I duck in there to get paper towels and toilet paper and stuff like that. But, but what's been really astounding for me is because of the arrows, it forces you go, to go down aisles. You might not typically go down. And there is an amazing amount of, you know, like food that I would not think about eating. <laughs> and and my, I'm not making any judgments on people who do, but um, just these products that, you know, all you have to do is add water and you have dinner, that sort of thing. And yeah. I think about the education that needs to happen in terms of the folks that may rely on those products. We've talked about this before and, and the fact that people don't necessarily even know how to, you know, um, peel a carrot or something, but... Um, I, I, do you have any thoughts about that, Ellen? You know, what it, it will take to potentially um, get people to the point where they might be able to do a little bit more in the kitchen? Well, I think a lot of that has happened during the pandemic out of necessity, yeah. right? I mean, we've been hearing that pretty consistently. People 
doing more cooking because they're not able to go out to the out to restaurants and stuff like they they used to. Um, we are still seeing very strong interest through our Rooted in Vermont campaign uh, of of you know folk Vermonters that hunt and fish and forage. You know this is ramp season now and. Uh, and uh, foraging for mushrooms and, and all sorts of interesting things that people are doing because out of necessity um, and they're finding like the value, the, the real, you know, it, it tastes good. And, and so I think one of the questions is gonna be how, how sticky is, the, is what we've learned over this past year gonna be going forward in terms of people's behavior and such. Um, so, you know, I think it's still, I think it's still too early to know that, but I think the other thing that I, I think that a lot of we consumers don't think of as a to-do item um, is we can put pressure on grocery stores to have different types of products, right? We don't have to just accept what it is that they put on the shelves. Um, I think if more of us really spoke to the, you know, sent in comments or dropped off comments and said, how come I can't find local carrots or how come I can't find, you know, local potatoes all year round when we, when we actually have storage capacity to, you know, storage ability to do things like that. Um, you know, I think supermarkets are going to, you know, they want to serve their customers and, um, you know, their mindset is how do I get the largest amount of regular, like totally um, predictable quantities from wherever I can get it at the lowest price to put on the shelves and, so, and, and with the greatest variety, right? That, that's like, that's where they're coming from. So if they don't hear from us as consumers, like, you know, why, why do you have all this crap in the center of the aisles? You know, wh why is it so hard to find uh, local produce or local meats or, you know, especially on the meat side of things? Um, the smaller stores, um, you know, the AG New England bought Mike Hummel's five stores a couple of years ago. And if you go to those stores like Richmond Market in Richmond or Village Market in Waterbury or the Jericho Market they built up in the uh, Jericho Underhill area, they, they've done a phenomenal job of, of sourcing local meat. They have a whole range. They have uh, stuff that they're getting from all over the country, but they also have a very strong section of local meat. And I have to believe that they wouldn't keep doing that if there weren't sales. So yeah. this is where the sort of buying power and the intentionality of consumers come in. And I think we could be doing more on that front. Yeah, and I, I think farm to school is actually, I, I, you may not be able to change um, adults, you know, in terms of their way of being, but uh, I think the more we can uh, deal with children and teaching children how to cook, um, I taught all of my boys to cook. So. They, they are now sometimes the major cookers in their families. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, here in Wyndham, it's such a small town, um, but we are, we are so, and we've never applied for a, <clears throat> a farm to school grant because we are small. And we also have this incredible resource of Meadows Bee Farm where the kids, um, Lee Marinoff has developed this badge program where kids um, learn fermentation. They, I mean, it's just this whole range of, of badges and it's sort of like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. They're doing a, an amazing job. And um, while well, some families don't necessarily see the value in it um, because they thought, oh, it's just farming, you know? Um, I, I think it, it also teaches responsibilities. They learn how to do the, the chores, you know? They learn this whole um, spectrum of things and as well as learn how, you know, where food comes from and, and actually how to cook it. Um, so at any rate, uh, Heather, your hand is up and so is John's. You go first, Heather. Thank you. And I think on one note, like processed foods are cheap. And so you have that financial element to consider. And then also there's the convenience of that. And if we remember when we had some of the farmers on, especially Suzanne Long, who was talking about investing in infrastructure that's 
community kitchen based where farmers do have a place that they can send all of their surplus food. And then not only are we just having the food available for folks to come pick up, but we're actually cooking with it. And it's creating a place where folks can come and pick up something that is convenient and easy and fresh, but equally focusing on that local element because you know, there is that lack of education about knowing how to use certain vegetables, but also sometimes people just like, we're in a very capitalist productivity society and you don't have time, right? Like I'm a farmer. I hardly have time to cook with the things that I'm making. And more often than not, I'm reaching for that box of pasta and I'm ashamed of myself when I do, but it's like, I know, thank you, Carolyn, but it's like, (laughs) we do need sometimes folks to sometimes prepare things for us and investing in that infrastructure, I think is part of that scale that we can do in Vermont. And it is an important part. Yeah, I don't, I certainly didn't mean to cast aspersions. I too use uh, store-bought pasta, trust me. I made pasta from scratch. What a lot of work. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I'm not, I, like I said, I'm not trying to um, assign blame here. It's more, you know, how can we tune people into, you know, fresh vegetables and how wonderful that is and, and figure out a way to get them to folks. Um, uh, John, go ahead. It's like true confessions here that I know, yeah. right? <laughs> we don't all in, in ag, we don't all make homemade pasta. Uh, I, you know, thinking of cultures and cultural change, uh, not I can see not only does it have to happen at the consumer level, but but Ellen, I, this I'm sure comes into it at like the CSG level and the six six states combined, where there'd be some some weight to it. Is that there needs to be I can see some change at the corporate cultural level because if this program was successful, you're going to run right into making Mondelez and Dole and Unilever, Procter and Gamble, you know, all those big corporations which fill all those aisles with their products. They're not going to be very happy about this. And so, uh, it at some point, it'd be great if they actually worked with a program like this uh, and didn't fight it. But I could, I could see they're not going to be very happy about losing market shares, and all those MBAs are going to figure out, you know, how do we essentially crush, crush New England's little project? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, and it is a real risk. I mean, you know, we're that that ha- and that has been a strategy right the that the way because local food has taken market share from large multinational food corporations in the last 15 20 years their strategy has been to buy up small local or regional brands for that attribute and so we don't have any illusions that that will continue to happen which is why we also really need to be investing in the profitability of these companies so that they have they have the ability to stick around. I mean, there's always the possibility that, you know, obviously there aren't going to be business owners that get into it because they want to, they, they, they're serial entrepreneurs. They want to, they want to grow something, then they want to sell it. That, you know, that's what they're right. But for those that actually want to be able to stay here and really invest for the long haul in their business uh, and grow it within the region uh, and be able to actually compete in the region, uh, then you know we do need to think about how are we prioritizing uh, and, and investing uh, as a region to enable that uh, and to have strong succession planning infrastructure like in people power to work with these business owners to understand uh, the various um, ways in which you can sell your company when, it, when it's time uh, and, and thinking through the different ownership structures uh, so that we can try to increase the, the likelihood of those of those um, businesses once they change hands of actually staying flo- owned from within the region. You know, I mean, Vermont Coffee Company, right? Just sold, uh, just announced, sold to Stonewall Kitchen, uh, and you know that's a that's an entity out of Maine. They but they they are national. They have national distribution outlets. And so the part of the reason Ben and Jerry sold to Unilever was because they needed national distribution outlets. So that's why it's like, 
you know, that's where, when I say we got to invest in all parts of the supply chain, that's why, right? We can't just invest only in farms and food businesses developing, and then not also invest in, in processing and distribution infrastructure, because because then the, those that that gr that actually are the primary producers get to a certain scale potentially, and they don't have any options for distribution, and then then the then they have no choice but to look for larger uh, buyers uh, and larger just for that distribution access because of the way the grocery market uh, has evolved over the last fifty years. So and to and to Representative Partridge, your point, you know, like no shame here, like this. This is the system we have now is has been 50 years in the making with intentional national policy to 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 grow it and and to move people out of food production and out of farming into other industries right so that there's fewer and fewer people producing all the food we all eat so that there's more people available for other types of of jobs and so, you know, if, if there is a societal reckoning here, we're at a point where we have to say, did we go too far? I think we have, but th that's a societal level question. You know, it's an existential type question. What, what, what have we lost because of the production uh, style that, that, that has evolved over the last 50 years? And what, what, do we, what do we want it to be in the 50 years going forward? How, what kinds of changes could we be putting in place now that sets us up and our our kids and grandkids and great grandkids for a different type of food system that is more equitable, that is more locally owned or regionally owned, that is more place-based, uh, and that is uh, profitable for those who are who are in the business of it. How how do we structure things? How do we structure our our our, our government systems, our regulations, our, our, our infrastructure to enable that, as opposed to what has been the case, which is just this cheap food policy, large scale production at any cost to the environment and externalities and those kinds of things. Ellen, I was thinking that the, the real model for what we're after here is the beer aisle in supermarkets because there's a place where New England really does have market penetration and you have a ton of local choices, but then I go down you know, the, the diaper aisle, I don't get to to choose, you know, 30% uh, New England diapers for my lambs here, uh, or, or, you know, Cheez-Its and, and uh, <coughs> um, Doritos. It, it, it's not like that's an option. Like, I want to buy New England Cheez-Its and Doritos. How does that happen? <laughs> you got to get somebody to make them. <laughs> um, Henry? Hi there. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. I'm did on you, a different, did, on a different you, device. Okay. Your and iPad I, still dead? My iPad is totally dead. Um, and uh, I apologize for having my video off. I, we've gone to remote learning for my kids, so they're running around here. Um, uh, like John, this raises so many questions. Um, but on that last topic, uh, Ellen, are there any examples that you guys have looked at um, maybe even more countries than states as far as who's doing doing that really well as far as looking at at local and and using food and and not using the the model that we've we've so well adopted here in in America is there other examples that and um, information out there of places that do this well that you guys have looked at at all or that we could maybe look into more? That's a good, really good question. And no, we haven't. I, I, what comes to mind though, is just how the Western European countries do it, you know, where it's much more place-based, there's much more regulation that supports uh, local producers and protects those products, whether there was a terroir element to it uh, or not, um, you know, it was interesting. I, I was listening to the, um, I, I'm not a big podcast listener or anything, but I, I recently sort of stumbled across the Ezra Klein show and he does, a, he, he produced, uh, publishes articles in the New York Times, but he publishes it uh, as a, first as a podcast. And, you know, he had, I forget the person that he had on, but uh, no, it was, it was Mark Bittman that he had, he was interviewing Mark Bittman. And Mark Bittman, I guess, has a new uh, book out 
uh, really looking at the history of food and uh, through the ages and sort of the key decision points that we've made. Uh, and he, he was one of the only people that I've listened to recently that, that hearkened back to the decision points made during uh, the so-called Green Revolution in the early 60s. Uh, and if you don't know about that era, that was a big era where um, international, and uh, many of it was US-based food companies were looking for less expensive inputs. And so they sort of sold this sort of, and, and they were looking for markets for like our tractors and our seeds and our fertilizers and such. And so they were, uh, they were supported through federal policy um, uh, to go out to other countries, developing countries like in Africa and South America and Central America, for instance, and to export our way of producing food. Um, at the same time that we were standing up this narrative of it's the job of the United States to feed the world, like our farmers feed the world. Those narratives really have set the whole world on a course of the way that the global food marketplace works and the futures markets and like all of that. Um, and what we've seen is the devastating consequences where you used to have countries in Africa and South and Central America where they would go through periods of famine, but they basically could feed themselves. <laughs> they, they weren't having mass starvations going on uh, the, the way they do now because their markets now are completely export oriented. They're, they're monocropping everything and selling into the export market because they were told and they were incentivized or they were purchased by these large corporate entities that, that said, this is the way that we have to do that. And so I, 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 it's not just a US or a Vermont or a New England reckoning of our food policy, it's a global reckoning. And I think what you're seeing coming out of, um, it was just an interesting article just a couple of days ago about Singapore. They've just created a policy of getting to 30% Singaporean food by 2030, because something like 90% of all the food they eat is imported as, you know, as a, in essence, an island nation. And so they've set a target of 30 by 30. And, and there's been other countries that have been doing that as, as well at, at coming out of the pandemic because they've recognized the vulnerabilities of being a monocrop oriented export only uh, country with their, with their agriculture. So I, I think this is like this pivotal decade to ha like have these conversations to really think about what do we want? You know, and then how do we set up the policies, the regulatory environment, the investments, the public, the national public policy to incent that and really be climate smart, climate friendly, you know, the way that uh, President Biden's talking about uh, and Secretary Vilsack are talking about, like we need to uh, really need to, to do this in a climate smart way. Um, and then of course, in the United States, there's also the racial reckoning. There's the, the, the reality of the way that so many, so much land was not only stolen from native peoples, but also stolen from African-Americans that had land back uh, after post-Civil War that um, over the succeeding uh, decades was, was taken away uh, and uh, they lost that land. And so what, what are we gonna do about that? Um, how do we get more uh, people of color on, on land and being able to access loans that anybody else can access, uh, any white person can access and be able to have an actual opportunity to succeed? So I don't have the answers. It's like this, it's just this big, huge conundrum, you know, it's just so complex, but I think we have a real, we're at that one of those pivotal moments that, that Mark Bittman talked about um, where we have some real choices to make. And um, so you all are, are, are key to that process. And I always like to think of conundrums and challenges as opportunities, so. Um, did you, so is that Ira Klein? Ezra Klein, Ezra Klein. Ezra, okay. Yeah, the Mark Bittman, it was a fascinating uh, podcast. I'll, um, I'll, I'll and, look and for I, that. It makes, me get, it makes me want to get his book because, because he does talk about these historical junctures where we made these choices. And that's the, that's the point here. They are choices, right? Yeah. And you all as legislators are part of helping to make choices about where to invest, what to regulate or not, uh, what to incent or not, 
Um, and and what narrative is put out there about the kind of food system that that we want in this state as well as this region and country? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, it was very hard to watch, and I I can't say that I watched all of it because it was so difficult. But um, Henry Louis Gates, um, who is a Harvard professor and does Finding Your Roots, the genealogy program on PBS. Um, did a show on reconstruction, which as everybody I probably knows is that period after the civil war uh, when slaves were freed, but they were kind of stuck, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and some of the things that happened at that time, it, it, was, it was really, um, it was, as I said, it was very hard to watch because uh, they weren't treated well. And, um, and, you know, in some cases they were able to acquire land, uh, but then as you said, uh, it was basically taken from them. Um, you know, folks with a lot of power would, would basically force them to sign the land over. So um, I think if anybody wanted to learn a little bit more about that time and, and, and if, you know, as we talk about the challenges for our BIPOC community, <clears throat> You should probably put that on your viewing list to, to have a greater understanding. Um, any other questions? Ellen, continue. We've sort of taken you off on a tangent, but <laughs> I, I love having this conversation. I think it's so valuable. I appreciate the opportunity. You guys ask really great questions and you're doing important work. And uh, so we're just, you know, we're in this in-between phase where we don't have a lot to, to ask you to do because we're, you know, besides reading the plan and figuring out what you might want to work on, um, I think, you know, we'll all be in a better place to, to um, launch into next session because, you know, you'll have some had some time with the plan. Uh, we'll be hopefully standing up some kind of a policy task force within the front of plate network to start thinking about annually how we could be uh, providing some greater uh, sense of prioritization ar around policy initiatives. Um, as I think you probably know, I got selected by the governor to be on the governor's commission on the future of agriculture. And so I think, you know, the intention is, is that that body will uh, provide uh, a series of recommendations to the governor for consideration to advance in time for next session. So. I, I think I think there'll be a lot more opportunity for you all to to like really uh, uh, dig in deeper next session. This is a good foundation uh, setting uh, session to really um, come up to speed on the, on all the latest uh, background information and sort of current trends and and those kinds of things. So I would just encourage you to you know when you're when you're off the summer now that we're going to be able to get out and about like go visit your local farms more and go talk, go, go ask for a, a tour of a food manufacturer in your, in your county, you know, like use the summer and fall to get out and learn since you're not, you know, not for re-election this year. This is your, this is your great window to get out and just ask a lot of questions and, you know, go get a tour at a, at a meat processing facility if you can stomach it. And, you know, or go up to the Food Venture Center someday when they're going to be processing vegetables for for institutional, you know, storage of, of uh, or institutional markets, for instance, and seeing what their freezer space looks like. I mean, just like any of those kinds of things that you can do to, you know, educate yourselves or talk to your local restaurant that you know is is sourcing. Like, how is that going? You know, just ask questions and and learn more over this next few months and. Uh, I think there'll be some real uh, good stuff to dig into next session. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be, um, it's, it's one of the things that's really exciting for me as we talk about doing things that really will have an incredible impact. And I um, also had a conversation earlier today with um, Allison Eastman. And um, I think that the governor's um, plan that he's coming up with will be making investments in um, agriculture as well, which is is really exciting. I would love to be able to, I'd love to see getting um, working lands uh, to a base budget number of minimum $3 million a year. I think that would be great. Yes, it would. Uh, yes, 
It would. And, 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 and I will say that in part, that would really help uh, to, to provide additional funding support also for the business and technical assistance community uh, because as a board member of Working Lands, I, you know, I read applications. And so I see uh, every year where those that have gone through and have worked with provide, uh, service providers have much stronger applications because their, their concept of their expansion plans or what they want to do differently or next are just much more well thought out. They're planned for, you know, you think about the Jonesland Farm example, you know, they we invested $100,000 in them last May for their transition from dairy to goat herd. That was, you know, they spent two years really learning about things and working with a number of service providers and working with Miles Hooper to really understand what they were getting into. Um, and, and so like they were ready for that kind of, uh, money to then come in and help them work through the process of transitioning. So that's the power, I think, of marrying grant dollars with uh, a strong technical and business assistance provider infrastructure, uh, because you're going to get better projects, <laughs> and and those and those projects are going to be more successful, which is going to get us where we really want to go, having really viable farm and food businesses and forest and forest products businesses. So, yes. Yes, and, 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 and. <laughs> and, and tell me, um, access to capital was always one of the big challenges. Um, how is that going? Is that better? Um, what's, what's the scoop with access to capital? Well, interestingly, I was just reading a, a report that uh, the Community Foundation uh, paid a little, a little money for to, to take a look at this notion of, of a, um, a loan guarantee pool. And what, Nancy Wasserman, who did the research, uh, indicated was that there's not really a problem with low cost capital from a debt perspective. Like, like all of the capital providers she talked to are not having problems getting capital and getting it out the door. The issue is, uh, and this is across, I mean, this is consistent with any sector in Vermont. The hardest part is coming up with the initial money, the early seed and early stage funding to start and grow, whether it's a farm or whether it's a food business. You know, it's, a, it's early stage when you're, you're just not producing enough working capital and you don't have enough equity built up to be able to then, and or enough equip, equipment to be able to bring in loan dollars. And sometimes, you know, debt is not, the, is not necessarily always the best uh, capital need or the, sort of the best capital uh, source for what is needed. Uh, you know, it's patient capital. It's it's patient equity. It's it's some of the you know having a few very patient investors who believe in what you're doing and can support you uh, through those early stages until you get to a point where you could then take on debt responsibly. Um, and responsibly meaning like you're not gonna you can pay it back in a way that's not going to be a detriment to continuing to grow your business, right? Um, so I think the capital gap is primarily around equity, uh, from what I understand. And the great thing about grant dollars is that they function like equity, right? So if you if you get a fifty thousand dollar working lands grant, and you go to Vita to get a hundred thousand dollar loan they count that $50,000 grant funds as part of your equity in the business. So another reason to get as much money into working lands as possible. <laughs> right. that, that those kinds of dollars are so critical to the overall capital stack that a business or a farm is going to be trying to put to assemble. Because, you know, t in today's day and age, you're, you're very rarely going to have uh, unless you've got access to a deep pocket, you're not going to have one source of capital. You know, you're not going to have one capital provider. You, you have to put together a mix, and and you need a diversity of of types of capital. And so, what we're really lacking is that uh, patient uh, and equity type capital. Yeah, and and so a few angel investors who. Angel investors that don't require or don't expect to have 35% returns on their money, right? Yes, it's, exactly. It's flexible investors who would be happy with 
five or 10 or even 15% return on their money overall over say a five or 10 year period, you know, like to be in line with like, you know, if you want to go, if you really want to just invest in something and get a high return uh, for that money, then, you know, invest, take your, take your risk on a, start, on a startup tech company because th they have greater capacity to do that kind of hockey stick. But if you're, if you want to invest in your local food system and, and the people that are going to stay here and be here and continue year after year after year to produce food for our communities, for instance, then, then invest like with a 5% or a 2% uh, rate of return expectation because it's not about the money. It's about ensuring that there's success and, and activity uh, and successful businesses in our community. So some of that is like, is that the, the, the um, it's the educational awareness of the investors too, of knowing uh, what their expectations are. Yeah. There's a reason yeah. why there's not a lot of venture capital <laughs> and equity <laughs> capital in the farm and food space, right? The, the margins just aren't there. So yeah. Is that all that's out there? Is that is there's no there's nobody that wants to you know be completely okay with a five or ten percent return, knowing that they're investing in a small business? We've seen that we have got a lot of people in Vermont that that do do that, um, and uh, it happens very quietly, and yeah. uh, uh, it's just not. We, but we need more more folks like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John, go ahead. Well, along these same lines um and and looking at, at how much federal money has come our way in crf or arpa money now uh and and why i thought it was brilliant that that we got to this point with a food coming in through the food security door um rather than just uh, you know straight up capital investment Ellen, at, at the federal level um it, are there discussions about sort of national security even and you know food security issues where after COVID and, and realizing all the bottlenecks that happen and all the you know empty shelves that happen that if there was money to develop this infrastructure regionally all over the U.S. Uh, you know so that every region had you know a, a toilet paper factory or every region uh <laughs> you know, had, had local meat that they could access in this sort of thing. Uh, just as we've seen, the federal government has so much money that that would be great if they, you know, could come up with, with matching dollars or just a, a, a continued stream of, of investment in this. It seems like, and, and everybody would be happy if it was every region got some. Really good question. I don't know the answer. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, talk to, our congressional delegation staffers in the state about what they're hearing. I think, you know, things are still very fluid and evolving. I think there has been a real great awakening and awareness by a lot of, about a lot of, of our congressional delegation folks. I know uh, Representative Welch and, and um, ha, you know, was like definitely like there was definitely some wake up work that had, that wake up that, that happened because of the magnitude of what was happening in the early days of COVID around the supply chain that I, that I heard about and talking to him, um, you know, a real interest. I think the question is, you know, we've done, and this gets back to that sort of overall question of what is the kind of food system we ultimately want and therefore how do we structure policies and our government structures to support that? Right, because for the last 50 years, it has been about the cheap food policy, which has then taken our tax dollars via then sub turned them into subsidies to corn, wheat, and soy producers in the Midwest primarily. Right, that's what we have incented. We have incented monocropping. So if if we don't want to incent that anymore, you know, just like the president's. Uh, infrastructure bill is saying no more uh, gas and oil subsidies, what would, it, what would happen if we started to really ratchet back subsidies of monocropping and instead we incented more of uh, diversified soil building, um, uh, climate friendly production practices for a diverse array of products. And we did so with some percentage for with regional allocations, you know, so your question, like, so especially, you know, there's always these formulas, right, that for federal distribution, what if we actually really applied that 
uh, to regions of the US so that like, I want the Southeast to be producing food for the Southeast. <laughs> I, I, you know, I want the Midwest to be producing food that Midwesterners can actually eat, right? So how could we actually incent our federal policy in that direction? Not wholesale, that's not gonna happen. You know, it's not gonna happen overnight. But if we started to ratchet back the subsidies and redirecting those to the kinds of things that we want to incent, how, what, what kind of change could we see from that? And I think that's, it'd be great to have, uh, 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 you know, to talk with the federal delegation about what they're seeing on the landscape in terms of that awareness, uh, especially given the openings that I think the Biden administration has, has, has opened up. You know, how do we actually then change the internal structure of USDA and the way that Congress is allocating funding and for what purposes through the USDA? Carolyn, maybe we should have have our partners at, um, from the Vermont delegation, at least, come in and talk about some of that stuff. Well, funny you should say that. I was just noting their names. <laughs> I think it's fascinating, you know, and, and, and they may not be able to fully tell you because things are so much in flux. But I think the question is, you know, what could they be doing? Uh, I was talking to my counterparts uh, in, in the Food Solutions New England, and they're starting to think about how to try to support regional policy coordination uh, in, in throughout New England. Like of all the different key organizations that have an interest in policy, is there a convening function that Food Solutions New England could provide to bring us together? And I said, yes, that would be awesome. And I think we pick one thing and we do it really well. And I, what I said was, influencing the titles uh, and the allocations in the in the next farm bill right so sort of like so they've they've stood up all these new programs around regional food which has been great and food hubs and especially crop block grants and all stuff but compared to what is going to wheat corn and soy in the midwest it's like it doesn't even compare it's not even on the same scale so what could we be doing as a block could we get the majority of our congressional delegation across the six states to be advocating for uh, more of a regionalized food system. Again, not to create little islands all over the place, but just increasing the percentage that is being produced and consumed within every region of the United States, not just in New England for New England, but you know, take a national view of this. What, what could that look like? Um, so like, that's just a concept at this point, whether that goes anywhere, whether it eventually leads anywhere, who knows, but like, that's, that, that's what the kind of thing that's been on my mind lately is how do, how do we, how do we get that kind of a conversation happening more? All right. Um, I'm furiously taking notes here. Um, Heather, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that is on my mind constantly as well, <laughs> all the time. And I am so, on board with ratcheting back subsidies and incenting change. And I think what stresses me out is the, the magnitude of needing to divest from corporate interests in politics, because a lot of policy is very much crafted based on the money that is coming in from larger food institutions. And I think that that is a challenge. I think that's really hard. And I think that's something that is important to recognize that much of that policy is crafted based on who is funneling funds. And I think that with that, there would have to be some kind of shift in corporate donations and, and lobbying. And I think that that is a part that if you're talking about food security, and if you're talking about that, it also has to be brought into the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think a good example of that was the sugar, um, the sugar industry, um, and the influence they had. Um, um, Vicky, go ahead. Your hand is up. Is this okay to just keep asking questions? Is it, I think it's fine. For, I okay. think for eight more minutes, and then I gotta go to another meeting. <laughs> How much? Four minutes. Eight. <laughs> okay. Um, probably you're not going to be able to answer this, Ellen, but while you were all talking, I was thinking about in a pandemic, so to speak, or a natural disaster, all of a sudden we're facing things we hadn't realized before, as you know, um, but we're dumping milk, 
and because schools and um, institutions close and just so many things. I'm just curious, Ellen, has there been conversations about in another future thing, we hope what doesn't happen, but instead of having to dump milk, let's say, it, does Cabot, have they had Agrimark, Art Mark, have they talked about ways to um, use the milk, but use it in a different way or distribute it in a different way? I mean, just ways where you have to transition quickly. And that's the hard part in, in a unforeseen circumstances, the quick amount of, oh, you know, this distribution chain isn't here. How can we go over there? You know, plan B's, <laughs> so to speak. Um, it's a good that's question. a huge, it's a huge part of dealing with unforeseen things. So I don't know what conversations have been happening. Maybe we could have some of them in. Um, and Ellen, I'm sure you're, these things are on your radar, but, but how do we use that milk in a more creative way instead of seeing it go down a drain? You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I would encourage you to have somebody from DFA and from um, from Cabot in. I mean, my understanding, I, I could be off on this, but my understanding was that it wasn't Cabot that was dumping milk. It was it was DFA, and and in part the reason that Cabot wasn't and why they were actually expanding the number of jobs and the number of shifts was because they had more and more demand for their cheese, and because the cheese plants, because Cabot is is product. Uh, you know, more diversified products and, and with their um, whole range of products, they have more ability to service uh, the consumer market with that kind of product mix. And so for them to be able to just increase production because there's increased demand, they have a greater potential for that because they have the, the equipment that then can be deployed to do that. My understanding, and I, again, I don't know all the details, was that part of the reason for the the milk dumping that happened back in 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 the spring, and I don't think it's it's still happening at all. I think it's that was a you know a, a short term thing, was because the mm -hmm. equipment at the milk bottling plants you know was putting was used to servicing certain kinds of institutional markets, and those markets didn't exist anymore, and they didn't have the equipment to be able to make to pivot and make those changes, right? Because there's there's a lot of of um, uh, specialization that happens within uh, the dairy processing uh, uh, infrastructure. So some plants, you know, focus on certain types of production and other plants focus on other types of production and they have the equipment to match that kind of production. So if they don't have, if there's no, all of a sudden the, the bottom drops out of the product market for what they normally produce, they kind of don't have like they don't have a lot of options because they don't have the physical equipment on site. They have to find a new home for that milk. And that takes time because of the way the distribution routes are set up and, and how things just normally flow to all of a sudden have an immediate need to like change where that hauling truck goes. is not something that can literally happen overnight. And I think even with the best planning would still be challenging. There still not be, I don't think we could get ever get to a point of uh, sort of uh, never again will milk get dumped. I just don't, I don't see that as realistic. Um, but I think you raise a good point about uh, do we have enough diversification within our dairy processing industry in the region to enable more quickly to pivot when needed? And I think those are big questions that I can't imagine aren't happening because it was so, it, it, it was so with us, you know, for that period. But I'm not privy to those conversations about what uh, those entities may be thinking about, how they're planning for it in the future. I and mean, that's it's kind of scenario planning for for big companies, you know, to think mm -hmm. about like if this happens, then what what's the, you know, how do we how do we shift? How do we pivot? Um, so it, you know, if you're curious about that, I would encourage you to talk to the folks that that are in it every day because I'm certainly not. Thanks, Ellen. <clears throat> Thank you. I, okay, we have about three minutes left with Ellen. Are there any final questions? Anything, Ellen, you want to add? No, just to say thank you for being on this and being so focused and asking good questions and really, you know, wanting to make a difference in our in our food system. So just really so appreciate everything that you guys do every day. I know that, that especially being online is not, it's not easy. And 
I look forward to, I'm hoping next by January, we'll be back in your room together. So that would be really nice. And, oh, and that'd please, be nice. you know, if you, if you want to do some touring <clears throat> around in your region and you're not sure like what might be a good example, you know, give us a shout. And um, if we can help identify some places for you to um, set up a little tour or something, I, you know, happy to, happy to help in that way any way we can. Fantastic. Ellen, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your expertise and your, your thinking out of the box, as we say. And so um, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. And we'll see you tomorrow talking about Vermont Technical College. I know. I'm, I'm really excited about that, too. <laughs> okay. Take care. See ya. see ya. Bye. All right, committee. Um, uh, so um, I've got on the list Heather Darby. Um, I've got on the list um, the federal delegation. Um, and for those of you who might want to listen to Ezra Klein's um, podcast with Mark Bittman, you could do that offline. Um, anyone else? Um, do, Vicki, do you want to hear from DFA uh, regarding, you know, uh, alternatives to dumping milk? I would love to actually, of what okay. they learned from the pandemic and how they look to the future for, for regional uh, milk or whatever, you know, what their, their distribution and chain is, it would be interesting. I'm sure we've heard from them some before, but it's always good to hear what's happening. <clears throat> also, while Ellen was talking, I thought about our, our forest products. She didn't mention it once, um, but I'd like to have Ed Larson back in and perhaps others in the wood products industry um, I know the pandemic really affected them and continues to be an issue in certain aspects of forestry. And um, even when I'm thinking about wood supply, so many of us have wood heat and uh, those can be, those chains of sale and such can be, dis can be disrupted easily. And that's an essential part of, of life. So I'd like to hear, um, take some time on the, the forest products aspect of our work as a committee. That's a great idea. How about if we start with um, the commissioner? Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, um, and then we can we can go from there and see see where it takes us. Um, yeah, I, I I'm surrounded by woods, but not not necessarily everybody is. So um, that could definitely be a uh, a problem. Okay, so I'll put um, the commissioner on, and then we'll uh, we'll go from from there. Um, so, uh, one of our jobs is to get, um, is to get S-102 out and, um, we, we're going to be hearing testimony this afternoon from some of the folks in the, uh, industry. And I'm wondering if there's anyone else you can think of. We can also talk about this later. Um, and I hope we're going to be off the floor in time for 2.30. Uh, if, if we get off earlier, then come to committee uh, as soon as we're done. Well, you know, I'll give you 10 or 15 minutes, but um, um, try and think of anybody else you think we should hear from regarding S-102. And um, so uh, for those who might just be tuning in, that's a compost, a foraging with chickens on compost and producing compost and also the um, supplements and, and registering them with the uh, with the Agency of Agriculture, as so many other um, feed supplements are. So, um, Vicki, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't think this is 102, but with, with extra money, if, if that happens with working lands, I'd love to hear from the working lands enterprise folks. Um, how, how can we distribute this money to <clears throat> some of these initiatives we're talking about, but also in the forest products industry as well? How does that work, um, the Working Lands Fund, help them? So just kind of a broad picture of that. And if we really get this money going, it'd be cool to hear how this will be ramped up. Yep, and forestry definitely is a part of uh, Working Lands mission. You know, it's not just agriculture, it's, it's forestry as well. So um, important point, Vicki. John. Well, like, like Vicki just mentioned, sort of post 102, um, 
I would love to hear from some people. I don't know if anybody at the agency of ag can speak as freely as Ellen about just sort of big picture cultural change stuff. And, and I'm thinking how, how would this translate into potential legislation? Because I think, you know, we're all so busy as citizen legislature legislators that it's sometimes hard for us to come up with, with a bill that might help towards what we were just talking about, but somebody at the agency or, or like Ellen with one foot sort of, you know, in, in government and, and one foot outside. Um, I would, I would love to just hear some, you know, potential, potential bill ideas that we could be thinking about this summer. Um, so when you say big picture ag stuff, can you be a little more specific? Um, Cause I, what I'm thinking now is Abby Willard. Do you mean right. ag development, that kind of thing? Exactly. Like, okay. you know, we got the big book ag Bible, but, but to start looking at some of those, you know, future thinking ideas as, as bills would be interesting. And, and you know, the agency can do some and the, and the marketplace will just take care of some, but you know, what do we do as a committee to, to, to grease the skids here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's on my mind too. You know, what, is there anything we can do? Uh, especially with, you know, I was thinking in terms of the regional food supply chain system, but you know, I'm always, I'm, I always love to, to make things uh, work a little bit better. So, um, so I'll put her on the list as well. Um, other, you know, and I actually, I was thinking, I, I just got my second shot on Monday. So yesterday I was in kind of rough shape, but, um, uh, I'm feeling much better today aside from a sore arm. And I'm thinking, you know, on the 19th of April, I'm going to be somewhat free. You know, I'll still wear masks and stuff, but we could get together for a picnic on the state house lawn. Um, so be thinking about that. We want it to be a warm day. <laughs> we did have a wonderful picnic. When was that? Was that last, was that August? I can't remember. It was so much fun. Vicki, do you remember when it was, was that August? <laughs> My head is saying July, but I don't know why yeah. that's happening. <laughs> you, you might be right. Um, it was, it was really fun. It was a nice potluck under some trees. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, I found out from Chief Romeo, that there is actually power out there. So if we, we ask, we can probably plug in our little crock pots and stuff and we can have hot food next time too. <laughs> We're gonna make a real production out of this. Um, and and uh, some spouses came, that was fun. That was really nice, um, really it nice. It was great, it was a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, Henry, go ahead. You can bring your kids. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a broad question about our role in in education. Um, I was thinking about a lot with what Ellen was saying and what we've been talking about, um, especially in primary, secondary um, education as uh, that revolves around agriculture and programs. And you know, I don't know. Some of my background is in economics, and we talk a lot about utility and driving utility as far as what people want and what people desire and what they're going to spend money on. Um, and just teaching that if, you know, we're talking about processed foods and, and people, if they're not exposed, and I know you've talked about it a little bit, Carolyn, as far as home ec and things in, in school and teaching people to cook. Um, but just, you know, I, I'm thinking big picture as far as teaching, teaching kids that aren't going to be exposed to the benefits of nutrition and cooking and where their food comes from, because especially kids nowadays are so far removed from agriculture and what they eat, whereas that really wasn't the case years ago. And there, there really was more ag education. And now it's not, as far as I know, it's not mandated. And I'm not one for a big heavy hand of telling, telling schools what they should, um, what they should teach. But I'm just wondering what our role is or what our possible role is as far as um, I don't know even requiring some sort of nutrition or ag education in in Vermont schools is that a topic that's ever been discussed? You know, um, 
it's um, it kind of come, comes under the purview as far as we go of farm to school. Okay. Um, because I think many, you know, it, all of the farm to school um, programs might be different. Um, there, there's no one prescribed thing. One, one town built a root, root cellar, but, but many of these folks are, are focused around good nutrition and teaching kids um, about that. Um, I can go on a diatribe about this a little bit. Um, and I did, I began to, but I, I reined myself in earlier when I was in seventh and eighth grade. So this is a long time ago. Um, there were actually, you know, you spent a year, this is by the way, also only for girls, which just irritates the living heck out of me. Um, but we would have one third of the year devoted to cooking one third of the year devoted to sewing and third <laughs> was dedicated to grooming. Oh my Lord. <laughs> like what kind of face do you have? How should you do your hair? I mean, um, I speak about it now. It was horrifying, but I actually grooming just lost me completely, but I really did enjoy cooking and the sewing class. Um, and I'd already learned to sew and my mother had already basically taught me to cook by the time I was 14 anyway. But anyway, I, this is, you can see, I can get off on this tangent and it makes me crazy. Um, but um, I think that cooking is so basic. You know, I, one of the things I have, all three of my kids are boys, but they learned how to cook because that's one of the basics, isn't it? You know, and and um, and they do a major portion of the cooking for their families now. Um, and two of two of my sons do, I think, what I would call most of the cooking. So, um, I, I, so I'm sort of speechless. I don't think I don't know if they do cooking in the high school now. Um, and and that's a really good question. I you know Henry, we could have somebody in from. Um, I could check with. Kate Webb and and others, but that's kind of nitty gritty curriculum type stuff. It's not really our purview, um, but it might be interesting to find out what would be the question you would want answered. You're muted. Um, yeah, yeah. Just just basically what what is is there any any requirements or, or what is, is there a baseline of what is taught? I mean, there must be, I don't know enough about education as far as like, there must be certain standards of which, you know, kids need to learn, you know, obviously they need to learn the alphabet. Well, that's a standard that's, that's mandated. Is there a standard for nutrition and for, um, you know, food safety? What, you know, I, I guess somebody that could answer those if that's something that's looked at and, um, you know, if, 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 you know, in my mind, and this is a personal thought, but I think food production and nutrition is more important than learning the alphabet, you know, you know, but that's, I realize that's not a, <laughs> you know, that's not a common thought, but I'm wondering if, if there's any requirement, um, what it would look like to have a requirement and if anybody else is, is thinking that that's important. You know, I'm just thinking about driving, this is a long, long-term, you know, goal, but driving the future of, you know, cause you have to create that want and desire and knowledge that, that this is important and, and creating utility essentially. Um, but so, yeah. So, so Mike Ferrant uh, sent me a chat and he said, I don't usually give input to committee meetings, but I think you should Mike, and I'm glad you did. But my daughter is doing the Spalding High School's gardening program this summer. It's called Berry Buds Program. Berry Town School does a gardening program too. And we have heard, I think it was Harwood uh, Union High School, uh, when, we, when we heard from about farm to school, um, we heard that they have a, a farm to school club, you know? And, and so they're learning about these things. Um, and, and so, but I don't know if, if there's anything um, curriculum wise prescribed by the agency of education 
requiring these things? So we can ask that question. I'll, I'll do a little sleuthing. And if you wanna do some sleuthing too, that would be great. But it may be at this point somewhat limited to farm, what farm to school does. Okay. That's a great question, a great area we could uh, talk about. I, you know, I may have told you this before. I, I love this little program. Um, there was a, if I've, if I've told you this, stop me, okay? Um, there is a, a program in Middlebury at the food co-op um, and it was kind of the beginning of gleaning. There was a wonderful young woman who was an intern there. And um, she, what she realized is that they had all this fresh produce, but nobody knew how to process it or very few knew how to process it. So they, um, she set up the situation where on the days when the food shelf, the food pantry was open, um, they would, she would cook a, a really delicious vegetable soup and she would have bags, you know, she would be giving out samples. She would have bags with all of the required ingredients uh, in it with the instructions on how to do it. So as people came in and it was sort of afternoon, probably, I don't know what afternoon of the week, but kids would take the samples. They love the soup. They would say to their parents, hey, let's take a bag, let's learn how to do it. And meanwhile, she would be demonstrating how to process the carrots and what have you. Um, it was just such a you win, 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 win. Um, I, I loved it. So, um, you know, those kinds of things I think are so important. And, you know, when you, when you show somebody, somebody how to do something, um, they, they really learn it. Um, what's that Piaget quote? I'll never get it right. You know, I hear and I forget. Um, ultimately, I, I see and I remember and I do and I can do it myself sort of thing. Anyway, um, that uh, that's really, that we, we, we can look into it. <laughs> my, my long way of getting around, we can look into it. Um, Rodney, you unmuted yourself. Did you want to say something? Uh I was just going to say uh, when, when uh, Henry was talking or you were talking about Berrytown, uh, Williamstown has a greenhouse. Uh, they used to use it to uh, raise raise vegetables for the food for the food cafeteria. Not sure what they're doing now. Um, then they started growing pot, and that, that didn't go over well. <laughs> is that before it was legal? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it probably wasn't legal for a high school kid either. So anyway. No, and I'm not sure it was a kid. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, one of those sticky situations. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and Leland and Gray uh, High School in Townsend has, I believe, a greenhouse. And that may have been the result of a farm to school grant. And they were doing the very same thing, not the growing of pot, uh, to my knowledge, but <laughs> definitely the um, growing of vegetables for the cafeteria. So yeah, those are really wonderful projects that um, have grown out of, um, no pun intended, grown out of farm to school. Um, Henry, are you done? Your hand's still up. No worries. Uh, John, go ahead. Uh, just Henry's, Henry's thoughts there made me think of an, another uh, uh, type of business that's in crisis. I think, you know, along with dairy farming is, is the plight of our general stores in Vermont. <clears throat> and, and it's just this, this, you know, very dark downward spiral. Um, so as places, not only are they cultural hubs, but they're also places that sell food. And so since we, you know, incentivize a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about, I would love to have a discussion about what we can do to bring back general stores or even keep the ones we have. Um, mm. You know, Tunbridge had, had 10 years ago, we had two, they're both shuttered now. And then, you know, you hear, some some hopeful stories like I think Maple Corner has a, a you know a community not for profit one and you may have to go more in that that direction but 
but I think they're really important and they're disappearing. Um, and I think the, what we were just talking about food and food security and, and markets, uh, they all come into play there. Yeah. Albany, and Vicky, Albany just opened one, right? Yes, they did that same thing, John, work together mm -hmm. as a community, got grants and such. It, it's kind of sad that it takes that amount of effort to do such a thing, but um, it had been burned and they had gas tanks under the ground and, and so a lot of complications, but it, it gives revitalized to communities to have that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Putney's gone through the same thing. I'm not as, <clears throat> excuse me, aware of all of the gyrations, but I think they, they you know, they closed, they had a fire, they, you know, they, they got it going again, they had a fire, it was pretty devastating. But um, I think one of the reasons why our general stores um, have struggled so much is because people don't use them. Um, and, and they, they, oh, well, we're going to Claremont to Market Basket or we're going to the grocery store. And so they don't, you know, and maybe a loaf of bread is a little more expensive and what have you. And so they, they choose, choose to, you know, buy the least expensive uh, food that they can. And when you're struggling for a living, that is one of the choices you might make is to just go someplace where the food is cheap. Um, I know Barnard has a wonderful, when Teo is a legislator, we all went up there and, um, and Barnard has a wonderful general store. Is that still doing well, Heather? Yeah, I actually worked there last winter <laughs> and I supply stuff from the farm there also and trying to get more local food in there, but they have new owners and it was also something where our community funded it to get it back up and running and, you know, we talked so much about the economic viability of it. And I think the challenge circling this back to like food security is that they're also a business and they're trying to make it. So purchasing from local producers is out of their price point. And that was so hard, but it is a beautiful general store. And it's when I grew up going to and enjoyed working there. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of dynamics, I think, that really go into trying to keep those viable, but also, you know, flipping that around to a rural community, we don't have access to a grocery store in Barnard, really anywhere close, and that is where folks do end up going, so they are critical. Yeah, 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 um, good. Any any other ideas, Vicki? I was just mulling over Henry's comments and questions. Do you remember? Oh, Iron Chef, that's what I was trying to think of. The Iron Chef contest and the kids come in to the state house and bring food. That's another kind of culinary program in some schools. Um, but it's interesting that how the pendulum swings because what Henry's comments are basically cooking and those essential things aren't part of curriculums anymore. I don't know how that happened, they drifted away. But I, I took home ec as well, Carolyn, you know, 50 some years ago, we didn't have the, the beauty part of it, <laughs> but the Lucky cooking you. And <laughs> we could go to charm school though, if we wanted to. <laughs> um, but, my, but the funny thing was my, my husband went to, took home ec. He's a better sewer than I am. And my, <laughs> my sister-in-law went to shop, you know, boys went to shop class. How many of you remember that? You know, yeah. you learned how to build <clears throat> stuff. <laughs> there was shop, but it was only for the boys. And I had one classmate, Nora Salamon. I, I, she was one of my good friends and she actually took shop. And I, I wished in retrospect that instead of grooming, I was able to get into the shop class because I would love to have done, you know, woodworking and what have you. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, this. I think the pendulum swinging, I think we'll definitely have to go back to those practical things. Jeez, you know, yes. we really need it. And the great thing about Iron Chef and which is sort of an outgrowth of Vermont, you know, Vermont feed, food education every day, and the and the food farm to school network is that <clears throat> um, it's it's co-ed, you know, it's not just geared to females because somehow we were expected to be doing all the cooking. Um, oh well, times have changed. Uh, John. Yeah. Yeah. That I think FFA and FBLA still exist, but uh, you know, were any of us members? And and do you ever check in with with high schools and see if they're still at all active? Because that would be another interesting 
you know, intersection with food. I mean, it's funny that like future business leaders didn't include farmers. <laughs> like they can all be just one, one group there. Yeah, uh, you know, um, we used to, FFA used to come to the state house, but it's been a long time. And it's not just the pandemic, I think that's held them back. Um, not sure. John, do you want to look into that and see about, you know, do a little research and see if FFA is um, yeah, still going sure. strong? Great. Yep. Jackie Folsom might be a great. Right. Person. I bet she, she would know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Terry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think uh, FFA is pretty strong still here in uh, Addison County anyway. Maybe not like it used to be, but uh, and 4-H too. I mean, mm -hmm. there's if uh, we have a fair this year, there's the 4-H building is always full of crafts and displays. And <clears throat> so it's a pretty, I mean, obviously there's a lot of them that show animals, but um, their 4-H is pretty big still. Yeah. And they, I mean, they actually have uh, cooking things too. I mean, there's sort of like a home ec 4-H division too. So as well <laughs> as showing cows if you prefer to do it the other way. So, but it's, you know, it's just a different, uh, different mindset now. Yep. I was thinking what, like uh, regional <clears throat> food hub, but it sounds very good, but, you know, people are used to going to Hannaford's and, you know, and they're buying oranges and bananas and they don't care, you know, they don't care if the carrot that came from Madison County or, you know, Missouri, they just buy carrots because it's there. It's the same as, you know, bananas and oranges and apples from Washington. You, you just kind of get used to it. everything just being there and you just walk through and you grab it and, it's no big deal. You don't even think about, well, they had to fly it in from Peru, you know, and probably sprayed it with something to keep it from ripening for five days and all that other good stuff. But, you know, I don't think young people, unless they're, they grew up that way, they're, they don't think about it. Yeah. 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 And I think that's one of the great things that uh, working lands farm to plate, farm to plate initially, and then working lands as well has really generated is um, a little bit of a consciousness raising um, <clears throat> regarding the value of local food. And, and uh, as we talk more about climate change and, and our carbon footprint, the notion, and you know, when Ellen was talking about subsidies, talking about subsidies, subsidized water out in California, um, <clears throat> um, which is a, when I worked at Harlow Farm years and years ago, um, it was one of the topics, you know, one of the, what, how can, how can California produce be so cheap? You know, when you're thinking about the fact that it gets transported all the way out here and, and um, it's subsidized with um, federal highways, it's subsidized in terms of water. Um, so um, these are all things that people are thinking about more, I think, but um, I agree with you, Terry, but you know, the average person you know, they go to the store and they just buy what they what they have there, and it's not a real. Um, there's not more value put on local food. So as as we think more about um, climate footprint, uh, carbon footprint, and what have you, um, and I'm also really looking forward to hearing from Ryan. We were supposed to hear from Ryan Patch yesterday afternoon about the payment for ecosystem services um, work that's going on and. Um, I'm interested to hear from him on what's what's happened there because people need to understand that if farmers are going to be employing soil health principles and techniques um, and if they're going to be sequestering carbon, there should be some way to reward them for that. So any other thoughts? All right. So, um, so I think what we'll do at this point, unless anybody has some additional thoughts or comments or questions, is we will, um, we will stop now and um, we'll be back. Uh, we're gonna be on the floor and then 
uh, when we get off the floor, and I haven't looked actually at the calendar yet, but um, hopefully we'll be off at least by 2.30 when we have these witnesses. Um, and and they their schedules, they were a little bit, um, you know, they're not as flexible as some of our other uh, witnesses. So so hopefully we'll get in there by 2.30 and, um, and we'll be able to hear from them. So there's a, there's a few amendments coming up on uh, not 315, what was um, the general contractor's bill? Yes. So okay. I don't know how long that will, you know, go on. <laughs> okay. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed that we get done <laughs> in a timely manner. But if it's past 2.30, um, and, but it's not ridiculous, like four o'clock, um, then we'll, we will come to committee and we'll hear from those folks. We'll just be a little bit flexible, but if we, by some miracle, get done a little early, you know, take a few minutes, but then come to committee. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. This has been a really great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And um, if you think, uh, if you have any more ideas, don't, don't hesitate to chime.